Welcome to the Bayesian Conspiracy. I'm Inyash Brodsky. I'm Steven Zipper. And this week we have with us Brian Hanlon. Brian, please say hello. Hi, thanks for having me. Absolutely. I met Brian when I went out to the Rationalist Solstice at, earlier in the day, a uh, meetup for EAs and general rationalist adjacent topics. As I discovered later, I thought at the time you were like really into the Yimby movement. And it wasn't until we were like halfway through our conversation that I was like, oh, this guy like is in charge of one of the major organizations. I think I missed the introduction at the very beginning. <laughs> yeah. So um, I lead California Yimby. We are the statewide housing advocacy organization that's responsible for uh, much of the pro-housing legislation coming out of the state. Wonderful. That is right up our alley. We have a lot of people who are interested in this kind of thing and a bunch of them that live in California as well, since we got a tech heavy listenership. Before we jump in, uh, I, I want to apologize ahead of time if I stutter more than usual. I am just coming off of COVID. I feel like I'm most of the way recovered, but uh, still a bit fatigued. So I will uh, try to make myself sound better in the magic of editing. <laughs> but well, I am glad to hear you're on the men, but you sound great to me. And if I stutter, it's just because I've been stuttering since I was a little kid. Uh, so apologies in advance. You sound great. You sounds like you definitely got over that stuttering at some point. Yeah, there was definitely a few years of speech therapy in elementary school. <laughs> so we'll see oh, how. yeah. Did you have the thing where afterwards you didn't talk very much because you had the leftover speech therapy fear of talking? No. No, you came out swinging once you could talk? Yeah, well, the thing is, I don't really mind stuttering. Okay. I mean, it's, you know, no one's perfect. No, you're, yeah. You're, you're doing better than I am on a good day, so. But, <laughs> you know, so I don't know if you're how familiar you are with our show or the listener base, which is to say they're probably all familiar with NIMBY and YIMBYism. But mm. do you want to do a, a bird's eye view, like someone asks you on an elevator pitch? Sure. Um, YIMBY uh, stands for Yes in My Backyard, meaning that we support more neighbors to live in, in our communities. Uh, and so in order to accommodate uh, more folks and to be welcoming, inclusive places that are affordable for everyone, we're going to need to build a lot more housing uh, and to make sure that we have housing that's affordable to people at all income levels. Excellent. It says in your bio here that you co-founded the California Renters Legal Advocacy and Education Fund, CARLA, in 2015. Was that the precursor to California Yimby? So, uh, yeah, I mean, the origin story of California Yimby very much lies uh, with CARLA, which is still kicking around. They are now known as the California Housing Defense Fund. They sue cities that violate state housing law. Uh, happy to tell you the story. It would take a couple of minutes, but I guess we do have time because we're on a podcast. Yeah. Yeah, super into it. So the first lawsuit that Carla filed was against the city of uh, Lafayette. Very, very long story there, but uh, bottom line is the city coerced a developer to instead of trying to build 315 apartments that would have been affordable to moderate income earners, to build 44 single family homes that would have been very expensive. <laughs> um, so long story short, we sued, we lost. Now we could have appealed, but it it was pretty clear to me that we would have lost our appeal. We settled where I completely bluffed our like ability to uh, continue on with an appeal because we would have gone bankrupt uh, had we actually tried doing so. And you know, realized that the Housing Accountability Act, uh, this uh, law that was passed way back in 1982 when I was born and was useless for much of its early history, was simply like, not as strong as we thought it was. So I found this organization with uh, Sonia Trous. Uh, neither of us are attorneys, uh, despite the fact that we read a lot of the case law and are very interested in these topics. Um, we didn't quite understand that these these words that you know mean certain things in ordinary American English, words like substantial actually don't mean that in uh, legal English. Uh, um, substantial, for instance, really just means more than a mere scintilla, which is important when a city must meet a substantial evidentiary standard when making findings. So the end result is that the courts are enormously deferential or were enormously deferential to city decision making. And so it was next to impossible to actually defeat them in court under the uh, laws that we were trying to enforce. So I thought to myself, well, if we're actually gonna succeed as a nonprofit, we need to change this law. So, okay, how do we do that? So I first wrote down a number of ideas that I wanted to change, met with a planner and a developer who uh, brought in some folks that she knew uh, who were planners, developers, and Linux attorneys, uh, had a round table discussion. Long story short, I incorporated their feedback, wrote a new version of the law, and then gave what I wrote to an actual attorney who rewrote what I wrote, and then just went working it in Sacramento. This bill ended up being um, probably the most impactful streamlining bill um, in order to accelerate mixed income housing that's passed in decades in California. 
And it was during this process where I was like, wow, I'm, I'm, I'm actually doing it. And this is when, you know, I didn't have any money. I really didn't have any connections in Sacramento. And it was at this time that I pitched my co-founders, Nat Friedman and Zach Rosen, who were both successful tech entrepreneurs, on creating a much more expansive state advocacy organization that could pass legislation. That ended up becoming California EMB. So the origins for California EMB very much came with Carla, uh, even though they do have a very different focus. Wow. Okay. I have a number of follow-up questions to that, <laughs> if you don't mind. The first one being, it sounds like originally when you sued that city for that law, screwing over those developers, it seems like this was like a personal thing for you. What prompted that? What's the story behind like why you decided, screw this, I'm suing these people? Yeah. Well, I don't really know how far back to get in the story. Um, like neither Sonia nor I had any skin in the game in terms of making money off of development. We were, like many advocates, really upset with the status quo in California where homelessness is the most significant manifestation of that, right? We have incredibly high rates of homelessness, especially street homelessness, for a lot of reasons. But the main reason is that we simply don't build enough housing. And so while most middle-income people, although some do, don't find themselves experiencing homelessness, the end result of this housing shortage is that upper-income people tend to live in housing that you know, middle-income people would have lived in 30, 40 years ago. Middle-income people live in housing that lower-income people would have lived in. Lower-income people might be stuck in SROs or doubling up or just severely rent burdened. And then folks below that are going to be living at the edge of a homelessness. And so when we heard about this case in Lafayette, we're like, well, this act of aggression will not stand. Like the city of Lafayette, this wealthy city that was founded specifically in order to restrict home building back in, I want to say 1967. And that is an important date. Uh, it was right around the Hunter's Point uprising in San Francisco, where you had uh, race-based fair housing concerns, to put it mildly. So you had all these wealthy suburbs decided that they were going to like lock down development to make sure that the wrong kind of person, in their view, didn't move to their community. And we you know we wanted to do something about it. What was the Hunter's Point uprising? Memories on a film here. I haven't read about it in years. In fact, there were many different types of uprisings or some that's called riots in the late 60s in many American cities, often in African-American neighborhoods. The trigger for those events may have been uh, it varied from place to place. Um, often it was uh, police violence. I forget what the precipitating event of the Hunter's Point uprising was, though. This 1967 was probably due to like redlining laws? I don't recall what oh, that was. Right. But it was a what most people would call a riot. And there were many uprisings in the United States um, in between like 67 and 68 around then. The Fair Housing Act was passed in 1968. And so it was like really like those two things, the, the combination of a lot of white people were some afraid to live in cities if there was going to be urban uprisings and urban violence. And then the Fair Housing Act really made it so that it was much more difficult to discriminate based on race. And so what a whole bunch of cities did is they won incorporated themselves. You had a lot of unincorporated county areas at that time. And by incorporating yourself, you can control land use. So then you can do things like ban apartment buildings, right? Which is what many, many wealthy cities did. And you can use other land use controls in order to make sure that only upper income people can live in your community. It's kind of crazy. The late 60s, early 70s period. I don't know why this isn't greater common knowledge, why we don't learn about it otherwise. But just a couple of years ago, I read Days of Rage. And apparently during like the peak of that unrest, there was like five bombings a day, like domestic terrorism bombings. Maybe some people were injured. Not a lot of people died. But just the fact that there was that much domestic violence is I, I would have never known. It feels crazy at this point. In history. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, uh, read about the uh, move movement in uh, Philadelphia, where the Philadelphia Police Department like literally like firebombed a house and killed people. I mean, it's it is pretty extraordinary. Um, and yeah, so look, I just Googled it. My first guess was uh, right here. The Hunters Point uprising was the result of uh, police violence uh, where they shot and killed a yeah, teenager. Okay. Jesus. Your initial lawsuit, you lost and realized that basically it was impossible to win given the other laws. And A, that's just like the kind of whatever bureaucratic stuff that is like a cheese grater to my brain and makes me just completely run out of momentum. But <laughs> way to like, you know, rather than say, all right, I guess it looks like the system is going to stop us. You're like, no, fuck that. We're going to, we're going to change know, the system. Yeah we'll, yeah. we'll change the system. That's awesome. Just, I, I just I wanted to, sh you know, shine a light on that is how awesome that was. That's what I wanted to ask about next. You said that you got a bunch of developers and other people in the industry to sit down with you and help you draft a law that would help 
actually increase the housing in California. How did you get these people to sit down with you and work on a law with you? Great question. A uh, woman, Denise Pinkston, she is a developer with a TMG Partners. She was a former planner and she really cares about housing affordability. Uh, she herself comes from humble background. She thinks it is unethical and wrong that cities, especially wealthy cities, prohibit a home building. She is a developer. She does have a financial interest in this, although I think her projects are mostly commercial development, although I'm not entirely sure. At any rate, so because she's been in this industry for many years, she knows lots of land use attorneys and other developers and planners. And when I went to her about what I wanted to do, she said, all right, I'll bring in board some of my folks. And so she organized the meeting, and I think it was in her office or at the office of like one of her attorneys or something. And we're all around a conference table, and I just lay out what we tried to accomplish in our lawsuit against Lafayette, why we lost, why we thought we would lose on appeal, and that the only way to enforce the intent of the Housing Accountability Act is to change the law. I went to them with you know my proposals. I wanted to get their feedback. They provided some other ideas for ways of strengthening the law. Then I copied and pasted the existing law into Microsoft Word, <laughs> enabled track changes, <laughs> and then I rewrote it. That's amazing. So you ran into someone passionate and with connections and experience, and she saw your passion and the work you'd already done with the lawsuit and put you in contact with other people. And based off that network and the reputational effects, managed to get that going. That's exactly right. Damn, that's amazing. Then you said after that, once this was written, your line was you were working it in Sacramento. What does working it mean? Yeah. So first, you've got to find a bill author. Bill author is a member of the legislature. Oftentimes, they actually do work their staff, like write legislation. Um, oftentimes, a lobbyist or an advocate or a random community member will come to them with a bill idea or maybe actually a finished piece of legislation um, and say, hey, do you believe in this? Like, will you author it for me? Will you introduce it in the state legislature? So what we had to do is we had to find an author. Uh, I won't get into the details because it's a little bit confusing because we ended up having two different conversations at the same time and having two authors which can be a real problem. Um, it ended up like working out fine. But one of those authors was State Senator Nancy Skinner, who has been friends with Denise Pinkson for many years. <laughs> and so Denise, you know, chatted with her good friend, State Senator Nancy Skinner about this idea. And then she agreed. What I did when I said like work it is I took the Capitol Corridor train from Oakland to Sacramento every week, sometimes more than once a week. I would go to committee hearings and testify. I was working with staffers, including committee consultants, in order to address stakeholder concerns. We did have a lot of opposition, especially from organized local groups like the League of California Cities, who claimed that what I was trying to do was unconstitutional. It was all very silly. It was just like a ton of policy work, explaining stuff, and then helping out with like vote counting, driving support where we could, et cetera. Uh, to be clear, I didn't really know what I was doing. This is the first time that I had tried passing legislation in Sacramento. It was very much trial by fire and like learning by doing. The end result is it was incredibly strong. And I'll pause for one moment. One of the reasons that this bill was so strong is because we ended up getting the support of the governor's office. And so as this bill was going through the committee process, I had to make a number of concessions in order to secure support from members of committee who found some of the arguments from, say, local cities to be persuasive. And so the bill was still in very good shape. It was still a very good bill, but it wasn't as strong as I wanted it. Meanwhile, I had met the uh, then director of the Housing and Community Development, the, the state agency in charge of housing policy at an affordable housing event. And I won a free lunch with him because there were these giant jars of Monopoly houses. And if you could guess the number of houses, then you would get a dinner with them. Oh, nice. <laughs> well, luckily, like I remember, you know, some simple like arithmetic and geometry and how do you calculate the area of a cylinder, right? And so like mm -hmm. I just kind of did it. I was the one who got the closest answer. That's so, just the coolest like how to get a conversation with the person you wanted to talk to story. <laughs> Math saves the day again. Yeah, no, right? Like this is before I actually really, really knew folks uh, in Sacramento. I had met him, told him I would do. You know, anyways, those whole times like pestering him, like, hey, I could really use the help of the governor <laughs> like to, to get this bill stronger. And again, like me not knowing that is very uncommon, right? That doesn't really happen. And so I was, you know, maybe had an unreasonable expectation. Um, but then after the bill moved through the various policy committees, 
I then get this call saying, okay, we're ready to engage. What do you want? At this time, the governor's office decided to support um, what ended up becoming a, a full housing package, a suite of uh, housing legislation to address various areas of concern in, in housing policy. And this bill became part of that negotiated package. And because it became part of this high profile package with legislative leadership and the governor's office involved, then we could really actually strengthen things. And so told them what I wanted, said, hey, look, like we negotiated out these amendments for these reasons because of these stakeholders, but this is what I think is most important. This is what's probably most controversial, et cetera. What can you do? They ended up negotiating back in almost everything I wanted. <laughs> it was really incredible. Wow. So like engaged support of the executive can be very, very, very helpful uh, when passing a legislation. Was that just like a timing coincidence where they wanted to do this kind of thing at this point and you already had something in the works? Yes. That's amazing. When you said that you met him through the guest, the houses in the jar at this affordable housing event, how did you get an invite to the affordable housing event in the first place? You know, I don't remember. It's possible that I paid to go. There is a, a nonprofit called Housing California. They host this annual housing conference. It's really like a trade show for the affordable housing industry, right? So like there'll be vendors there that will sell bed bug resistant mattresses or like whatever, right? Attorneys that offer services to help structure affordable housing finance deals, et cetera, et cetera, right? You know, the affordable housing industry is an industry. It's a big industry trade show. And I went and, you know, went to various workshops to, you know, learn more about what was going on in that industry. And one of those events was, a uh, you know, meet the new director of the Department of Housing and Community Development. So, yeah, I went and guessed the number of monopoly houses. Did I miss what, like, roughly year this was? Uh, I'm trying to just put together yeah, a timeline. Yeah, so this would have been 2016, I'm pretty sure. The guessing monopoly houses, I'm pretty sure that was 2016, but the legislation was 2017. So all this was going on in like the spring and the summer of 2017. Because Carla was founded in 2015, right? Correct. Okay, yeah. Sorry, what were you going to say, Yash? Oh, a year or two ago, we did an episode about getting lucky and how important luck is. One of the things that came up from that was insert yourself like personally, physically in as many places where these sorts of interactions can happen as possible. Do you think that was a big part of this, that you were there in person places? Oh, absolutely. Look, I mean, there was a lot of luck involved and there was also a lot of like making my own luck, right? By, right. by, by doing- Luck is like, always made. Um, yeah. You're also getting at part of the reason why like I love cities. Urban agglomeration is a beautiful thing. And if you, to the extent that you can have all of these types of either planned or unplanned interactions like with folks, that's you know how new ideas emerge, how new relationships form, how you're able to move history forward. Because our audience is um, a highly nerdy type of audience, sure. and we often look down upon things like fashion, is it important to like be well dressed or be fashionable or something at these events? How how much of a oh. big deal? To <laughs> be fashionable, no. <laughs> okay, um, uh, but to be well dressed, yeah. Like you should, if you're a man, you should wear a suit that fits you. Um, and if you're a woman, then you should be dressed professionally. Um, if you show up at these events dressed like SBF, then you will not be taken seriously unless if you have the money he pretended to have. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You can't Zuckerberg your way in there in a hoodie and jeans, right? Well, it's, um, it's really like you could if you're Mark Zuckerberg, right? Right. Like, right. If you're, I mean, I, I won't get into this one meeting I had with the governor's office where, uh, you know, of course I was in a suit and he was in a suit and someone else there who was a wealthy tech executive uh, was like very nice jeans and like, like a nice, you know, clean shirt. But I'm like, oh man. I, I love it. Just representing just tech nerd, you know, yeah. as much as they can. <laughs> but again, like you can, you know, that's the sort of thing like you can do if you're wealthy, but if you're just an ordinary tech nerd software engineer, like no, buy a suit that fits you. It also sounds like all the work went into before the bill got on the floor. And by the time it was going up for vote, you pretty much knew how the vote was going to go. With this particular bill, absolutely. And in fact, I was very nervous that this bill could get caught up in the overall the much more contentious politics of passing the overall housing package because we had done our vote count. I had the votes. Like I, I knew I had the votes. The only thing I was concerned about was, is there some chance that if other housing bills can't make it forward, leadership won't call up this bill for a vote, right? Mm. So that was my uh, concern. Fortunately, everything got called and everything passed. Was there anything you could have done if that did happen, that leadership wasn't going to call it up? If leadership doesn't call it up, no, there's not much you can do about that other than blow up leadership, right? Or 
if you hear they're not going to call it up, like sometimes you'll get some advance notice, you can go public fast. I mean, like this is what happened a few years later with one bill where, I mean, I don't know if you want me to get in this whole story right now, but I got some intel that a leader of the house was not going to call one of my bills up and we only had minutes to spare. Like there was no inside lobbying or that could be done. So we just like went to Twitter and just did everything. And then of course, like all like, all, like DMs, Slack messages and emails and, and text messages, right? Like really trying to blow everyone up to try to drive media coverage in effect to make sure that you couldn't kill a bill quietly by not calling it up, that there was going to be some cost. That's Did awesome. that work, the blowing it up on Twitter? Uh, we succeeded in blowing it up on Twitter. So then, I mean, <laughs> and I think because of what we did, he actually ended up calling the bill, but the bill got called at like 11.57 p.m. or something. Oh, no. The, the rules. And so it, it needs to pass that house, which it did. And then okay. it needs to go to the concurrence break. But like th there wasn't enough time to pass it before like the constitutionally mandated deadline. And so it, it died. What a oh, lot of crap. Man. But, yeah, it was but, very, oh, I was very pleasured. We ended up passing a similar version of the bill next year, or like the following year. But it was that was still a huge, huge political fight uh, and like really tough. It's still cool that using every tool at your disposal to, you know, so you get the people they're representing up in arms about it. And like, look, this is what people are mad because you're not listening. Yeah. You know, the vibe of like, get shit done. We're going to do this, yeah. you know, is admirable as all hell. Not being stopped at points where a lot of, where there's a lot of opportunities to give up, you know? Yeah, thanks. I mean, like this phrase doesn't quite roll off the tongue, but I often say that California YIMBY is an outcomes-oriented, evidence-based advocacy organization. And that <laughs> say really, that three times fast. <laughs> yeah, right. And I say that in part to show how we're different or to try to like explain how like we are different than many other groups. I mean, a lot of groups, they're certainly not outcome oriented, right? I mean, unless like the outcome is like generating outrage and like raising a bunch of money and doing some media and making yourself feel like you're making a big difference by just like being self-righteously angry, but then like failing to move substantial policy or like not evidence-based in that oh, there's a lot of policy making done by vibes and we're not really about that. Well, let's jump on those two real quick then. When you say outcomes oriented, what outcomes are you oriented around? Sure. We are interested in improving the material conditions of all Californians and will-be Californians in need of housing. We are also interested in reducing greenhouse gas emissions through eventually um, urban decarbonization. These are things that there are various ways to measure them. We evaluate our success as an organization primarily through what policy are we moving that is going to have the desired real world effects. Where does your motivation to help solve this problem come from? I think you touched on it earlier, but I don't know if you had more to say on it. You know, I don't, you know, let's say the, the ultimate reason why I care about this instead of getting into antique map collecting or something. Um, <laughs> a few things. One, I've always loved cities. I grew up in the suburbs and there weren't sidewalks and I never had a car and I couldn't get anywhere and it was, you know, boring and sucked. I just like love lying to my parents and going to punk shows in DC and Baltimore, <laughs> right? Um, and like wanting to live in cities. And two, I always had, I think, a strong sense of justice and injustice. And I think it is wrong that many incumbent residents of cities are passing policies to, in the case of homeowners, enrich themselves. Um, and in the case of you know many incumbents, just deny newcomers access to the opportunities that they had. So I first started getting involved in housing activism, actually not through pro housing production work, although I always supported it. Uh, it was through eviction free San Francisco and other more like lefty tenant oriented groups that were protesting landlords that were trying to evict my neighbors through like no fault of their own. And while I still very much support robust renter rights, uh, California EMB, we support rent stabilization, we've supported just cause eviction protections and the rest. The root cause of no fault evictions, uh, that is the root cause of housing and affordability, uh, the root cause of increasing in many cases, racial and economic segregation is this lack of home building. Ultimately, I left slash got kicked out of the more like tenant oriented scene because like a, a lot of them, especially in San Francisco, oppose new home building. Uh, but my motivations and my values, I would say, are still the same today. 
as they were, you know, back in like 2013 when I first started going to protest outside of landlord's houses. Hell yeah. I, I love it. I share a lot of your, your passion there, but I guess I've done exactly zero activism. I don't know if Inyash <laughs> mentioned, but we live on basically opposite sides of the greater Denver area, which from people that I bump into who are from California is quickly developing a lot of the same problems. Do either of you live in Boulder? No. no. Yeah, Boulder, <laughs> Boulder is even worse. This, like nimble, yeah. dark, dark place. Yeah, uh, we yeah, can't, we can't live in Boulder. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Unless like our grandparents bought property there, there's no way we're going to Boulder. Yeah. No, that's, that's exactly right. Um, yeah. No, like Boulder and, I, and, and Berkeley have a lot in common. Boulder's definitely worse, <laughs> like in terms of its, in terms of its nimbyism. Oh, worse than Berkeley. Oh, yeah. Like, Berkeley's bad, but Berkeley is changing over the past few years, especially like in part due to a lot of Yimby activism. Um, mm -hmm. In 2016, the first Yimby town, the supposedly annual gathering of Yimbys, was in Boulder. Oh, excellent. Well, good for them. It seems like a positive trend. I have a 30 second digression. What sure. was the favorite punk show you went to? Oh, man, that's impossible. I don't know. When I was growing up, I mostly listened to East Coast street punk. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I think like most of the bands I listened to, like no one would have heard of because they were bands that like 16 year old suburban punks went to. <laughs> I don't know. Yes. Like, it's always better when you can get right up next to the stage and yeah, the guys oh, are just 100%, away. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I will say, I don't know, like the Goons show at the Auto Bar in Baltimore was pretty fun. Um, yeah, they were like a ton. Excellent. You heard it here first. The goons are the best punk band. I would not say that. <laughs> I would not say the goons are the best punk band. I would say that was a pretty fun show. And the thing is, I think I mostly remember it because there was a line uh, in this band, uh, uh, Black Eyes. They, they were a DC-based uh, punk band, a much better punk band than the goons. And I actually did see them. I, I saw them in Charlottesville um, uh, years ago. But it's, and I'm going to like mess it up here. It's something like, what will I say? I'm driving south, like heading south from Baltimore. Like, what will I say when I get home? Blah, blah. And anyways, this is like a line that was like absolutely me. Be like, oh, yeah, I told my parents I was like going to the mall or something like, with friends. Mm. You know, like, I come home like late at night. It's fantastic. You know, anyways, that was a bit more than 30 second digression, I guess. Apologies. Oh, that's fine. It was fun. You said in favor of rent stabilization. Doesn't rent stabilization also discourage home building? So it depends. I say rent stabilization typically instead of rent control. Although, like, what's the, the difference between like rent control and rent stabilization? There's not like a hard and fast line. I would just say like the details matter. So, like for instance, if you passed a rent stabilization ordinance that said no building is impacted for its first 20 years of existence or something, right? And the rate of allowable increase is going to be some percentage plus CPI. Is that actually really going to restrict? New home building? Mm. I don't think so, right? I mean, construction loans are like 10 years. Like maybe there are some sort of deals where like, well, it's going to be slightly harder to sell in the future or something or like whatever. But I am deeply skeptical that those types of rent stabilization ordinances actually do discourage new home building. That said, if you passed, and there have been efforts to pass, legislation that would bring new buildings immediately under rent control and would like limit rent control to something like say 60% of CPI, then yeah. absolutely, yeah, that would significantly slow down uh, new home building, which would make the overall problem worse for renters. Yeah, that's the sort of thing I was thinking of. I didn't realize there were the more reasonable versions out there. Yeah, but this is why I said like, you know, evidence-based, like the details matter. We have opposed or not supported some rent control proposals and we have supported others. The details matter and you've got to do the analysis to make sure that you're not causing unintended harms. Although I should say there have been rent control proposals where some of the proponents absolutely knew it would shut down new home building, which was fine by them. <laughs> so it's not, the harm isn't oh, always unintended. <laughs> feature, not a bug. Yeah. Damn. So uh, you also said that you're evidence-based on the outcomes orientation. What is the sorts of evidence that you use? Because you said something like uh, improved material conditions as an outcome. That, that seems like hard to define. Yeah. Well, so, well, there's a way to define it. It's just extremely difficult to attribute specific bills to those better outcomes, right? So like, like you can imagine percent of Californians uh, who are rent burdened. You could imagine the affordability ratios for buying homes. You could look at industry of uh, racial and economic integration. Like, like there are all sorts of ways that you could quantify what we're trying to bring about. The really tough thing is, well, how do you measure the impact of legislation that like, changes the housing approval process that you can't really easily track? You could sort of model it, but like not well. 
and it, it doesn't take effect right away. So like, like that's like the really tricky thing. When I say evidence base, what I would say we're, I'm mostly referring to is the policies that we're proposing. Like, why do we propose the policies that we do? It's because we have a lot of evidence that our specific policy remedies are good. Uh, so for instance, last year, one of our you know top priority bills was a bill to end mandatory parking uh, minimums for housing projects and other projects near transit. Right. There is a ton, a ton, a ton of evidence that parking requirements not only restrict home building because these parking requirements are often totally divorced from any sort of market demand. You have cities that might require two off-street parking spaces per studio apartment or something. Structured parking can cost between forty dollars and $80,000 a unit in California. It just becomes impossible to, uh, to finance. You also induce more traffic, more people drive when there is that seemingly free parking because you're not unbundling it from the overall rent or a home purchase price. And so it, it like leaves like all of these bad things we don't want. And so we wanted to end it. There were some folks who were arguing that, well, this is going to make it harder to build low-income housing. They never had any good arguments whatsoever. We looked at studies in Los Angeles and in San Diego that found that removing parking mandates actually increased the production of affordable housing, both in terms of 100% publicly subsidized affordable housing and in the case where affordable housing is subsidized by the private market in the form of inclusionary zoning, they just had you know no evidence to stand on. And ultimately we were able to prevail, but it's tough. Like there are many, many well-established organizations in California in the advocacy space that simply policy make based on vibes and feelings and what they think their ideology should tell them rather than what the evidence states. Right. So when you got that first big bill passed, what was it that made you say, rather than I got that done, I've made the state better and I'm going to continue on doing other things that you decided to make this a bigger mission to keep going with this? I mean, you've been doing this for better part of a decade now, right? Um, so I started Yimbying in what, I don't know, January or something like 2015, but I didn't quit my job and start doing this full time until... I think it was October 1st of 2016, I think. So with California Yimby, I really made that decision to start California Yimby before the bill was actually passed. Because it was as this bill, SB 167, was making its way through the committee process. At that point, I realized, wait, there's something really here. Like, I, I can actually do this. However, I can't do my own. I want to pass bigger, much more transformative legislation that's going to combine best-in-class policy development, working you know inside the building is what it's called in the sacramento state legislature with excellent lobbyists to build coalition both with sort of powerful interest groups that have representation in sacramento as well as organizations sort of the broader california civil society to grow the grassroots EMB movement and then leverage that movement to support um, uh, legislation in the district of key legislators uh, and then also to start a political action committee to help elect pro-housing uh, elected officials when I pitched Nat and Zach, and, and I think this pitch was, I want to say in like April of 2017, when we were drinking at Terroir, and God, I don't know, we were there for hours. We probably ordered like four or five bottles of wine or something like over the course <laughs> of the evening. And I think, I don't know, like maybe my, my pitch was more convincing <laughs> and it seemed like more doable because we were drinking, but yeah, they were sold. And so then at that point decided that we're going to go. And so like the, the next year, January 2018, we come back with SB 827, which was this much, much more transformative bill that, that didn't pass, but did, you know, I would argue change the housing conversation in the Anglosphere um, and really expanded the horizon of political possibilities uh, for addressing the housing shortage. So, and like other bills passed because of that bill. So you consider SB 827 to be like the really big cornerstone thing that changed the game? Yeah, even though it didn't pass, but that's really, you know, what changed the housing narrative, as, as I say. Huh. What effects have you seen from that bill? Well, I mean, it's the Kiwis basically just passed it in, in New Zealand <laughs> last year, oh. which is great. Part of small things, like if you look at press coverage for that bill, we had significant national coverage and even international coverage pretty quickly. And to be clear, like I had no PR strategy or no comm strategy. I had no comm team and no budget for it. We introduced that bill when I had only two staffers and they had both been on the job for like six weeks apiece. I think it, it made such a difference because it's the first time that anyone had ever proposed solving the problem. Which oh. sounds crazy when like I say it out loud. 
because you have all of these different housing advocacy organizations, all these groups that say they want to solve these housing problems for, for low income people, achieve racial justice, et cetera. But none of them have ever actually proposed solving the problem, right? Like none of them have actually proposed bringing about this sort of world that they want. And we did that. Now, obviously, it was kind of impossible, right? Like when you propose radically transforming the built environment of the world's fifth largest economy, you know, like some people get upset by that, right? <laughs> like some people don't support it. Uh, and so it didn't pass, but it changed how people thought about, I think, housing policy and the scale at which we needed to address it. And so with things like AB 2011, this, the bill by Buffy Wicks that upzoned and streamlined housing along, like mixed income housing along commercial corridors in California, which passed last year, would that have passed were it not for SB 827? I don't think so. And, and now that it's, it's somewhere Wicks, because she said <laughs> that it, <laughs> that effort wouldn't have passed, like were it not for efforts led by state Senator Scott Wiener, who was our author for that bill two of our most important ADU or accessory dwelling unit reforms, which have been hugely successful in California. It went from basically zero permits a year to 20,000 plus permits a year. What are those? Um, so like ADUs are granny flats. And so think like like a backyard cottage in a single family home, ah, or okay. maybe you're going to convert your garage to a little apartment, that sort of thing. So now in California, you can actually build two of them on almost all single family home parcels. Uh, and, that, and that's thanks to legislation that we authored that I don't think would have passed were it not for these massive transformative bills that were also like sucking all the oxygen out of the room, right? And like all the media attention. We very intentionally didn't do any press and didn't really talk publicly about our ADU bills while we had our SB 27 and its successor bill, SB 50, in the mix. It sounds like those two bills really lay out the foundation, the main thrust of what you are trying to do. What are the policy goals, the recommendations to solve this problem that are the primary driving forces in these bills? Yeah, so there's there's a lot of stuff that I could talk about, but I'd say the basic problem in California and in many high cost areas is that we don't build enough housing. And we especially don't build enough housing where we most need it near jobs and transit in high opportunity, nice areas. So in order to, to change that, we need three basic things. One, we need a, what's called a streamlined housing production or allow buy right housing production. So in places like in places with crippling housing shortages, like, say, California or England, housing is typically not buy right, meaning that let's say that you're a developer, you decide that you want to build some housing, you, you think you can make some money doing it as a market demand. So you look at the local rules, and you put together a project that complies with those local rules, and then you submit that proposal to civil servants. Well, you might think that civil servants would just review the application and live the rules. And if you satisfy the rules, then you get your building permits, which is how it works in most of the developed world. That is just the beginning of a potentially years long, lengthy perhaps interminable process in California for getting housing built. Uh, I could get into the specifics uh, for why, but effectively there are, we live in a vetocracy and there are many, many avenues to either kill or indefinitely delay housing approvals. So we need to fix that. Two, we need to increase the legal development capacity in areas where we should be building more. So we need to up zone, that's what it's often called. So maybe it means that you can build taller building, maybe it means you can build a building that occupies a larger percentage of the lot, maybe it means you can fit more units in a given building envelope, etc. But we just need to be able to build more homes on a given parcel of land. And then three, we need to minimize or eliminate expensive fees or requirements for new home building. Now, some requirements make a ton of sense. Housing needs to be safe, <laughs> like it needs to be able to withstand earthquakes and uh, it shouldn't burn down if there's a spark, <laughs> like all the rest, right? Like there are important like health and safety standards in home building that are really important. We don't want to get rid of that. Uh, like many cities might impose like a $70,000 per unit parks fee. Ooh which is insane. And then maybe there are arts fees, there are affordable housing impact fees, and then there are infrastructure fees like sewage hookup fees and water hookup fees and all the rest. And some of this stuff sounds reasonable, some of it sounds good, and most of these things are actually very useful that's getting paid for. But we're effectively taxing new housing production in order to pay for all this other good stuff, which is like the exact wrong thing that we should be taxing. So it sounds like now you're passing those sorts of things in pieces when you can? In pieces, yeah. Ha having one big bill to solve it all is going to be tough. Um, to, to back up, 
SP50 really would have solved a lot. It didn't pass. Then our strategy through 2020, 2021 was really to break it up and to try to pass a bunch of smaller bills, which then continued into 2022. And that largely worked. We actually have made really big progress over the past few years passing smaller, more focused bills that in aggregate will make a large difference. That said, soon this year, we will be, again, introducing uh, a really, really big bill. I can't get into the details quite yet, but it will be an effort to better align our state's uh, housing and climate policies to accelerate home building where we most need it and to impose some sensible restrictions on home building where we should not be building. Ooh, exciting. You'll have to update us when that actually becomes public. we Will do. Do you uh, have a good guess as to why SB 50 didn't pass? Well, yeah, <laughs> because like we would have upended a century of racialized wealth accumulation in suburbs, oh. <laughs> I think, okay. suburbs right? I mean, a lot of people don't like that. Um, we had the, the main reason it died. Okay, so it died on the floor of the state Senate, which is the, the house that it was introduced in. Um, it died 18 to 15. So even though we had more I votes, you actually need 21 to pass it. We had two more votes on the floor, people who were willing to go up if we could find a third vote, which is pretty common for controversial bills because you don't want to stick your neck out if it's not going to make a difference. I do believe that these two members were being honest. They were both in sort of purplish kind of districts with competitive races, and they didn't want to take a controversial vote unless it really mattered. We could not find a third vote despite our best efforts, uh, and so it died. The main source of opposition was local cities vehemently opposed it. Homeowner advocacy organizations, homeowners associations very much opposed it. And that was really the main powerful opposition. Narratively, you also have the opposition of a lot of so-called equity or poverty advocates or racial justice advocates whose arguments I don't think were good uh, or sound. I guess this kind of brings me to the next larger meta question that I had. Building more housing seems kind of unpopular in general. I was surprised the last place that I lived at, um, there was a big empty lot that was just kind of used to store firewood, mm -hmm. like a terrible use of land in a place where people really want to live. And I was happy. I saw a big sign up that said this, it had been sold to developers, but like the sign was obviously placed there by the previous owners tacked up to a tree and spray painted in angry letters. This property has been sold to developers. Yeah. And I was like, first of all, you sold the property, so let's shut the hell up. Uh, but also second, like, that's good because more people will live here. Why is it that they are unhappy they sold to developers and everyone around they assume is also going to be unhappy? Why don't, why don't people like more housing and how do you build support for actual more housing? Yeah, so two really big, really important questions. Um, so the, the first one, why don't people support more housing? Well, like I would suggest that most people actually do support more home building. We have many, many polls, uh, some that we've done, most that we have not done, that show that a majority of Californians support building more housing, even in single family home neighborhoods, even in their neighborhood. There's a broad based support for more housing, but it's not very deep. And so this is really where the sense of like concentrated farms or interest like comes into play. It's kind of like the gun control issue where most Americans support more reasonable restrictions on gun control. And yet it's next to impossible to get it done in part because the relatively small percentage of Americans that is vehemently opposed to it, they are really, really opposed to it. That's what they vote on. That's what they organize on. They really, really care. The intensity just isn't there as much on the program control side. Similarly, on housing, most people sort of atmospherically support more home building, but they're not really going to do much about it. Whereas like NIMBY neighbors, this is what they vote on, it's what they organize on. And NIMBYing is like a force that gives their life meaning. So if you're a politician, you know that supporting housing might get you some good press. Most voters will care and support it but a sizable minority will not only be against it, they will then start campaigning for your opponent and knocking on doors and donating money. You've really got to weigh that. And so this right. is really where the YIMBY movement comes in to be that strong support for housing to really counter the NIMBY to say, hey, we also will knock on doors and donate money and attend community meetings and write letters to the editor and do all the things that NIMBYs do in order to really show that, hey, building more housing is both popular and 
there is a, a minority, but a dedicated politically influential minority of folks who really do want more home building and will vote on it. That explains why things have been changing in places like California recently, I think. But two, I, I would just also suggest when you ask why don't many people support it, I think apart from the sort of standard, like a construction project outside your front window kind of sucks, uh, you know, maybe right. this is noisy, like that's normal. There's no stuff. There's a kind of like folk economics going on here. There's a great article that came out, co-authored actually by California's former resource director, Stan Oklopgia, along with Clayton Nall at UC Santa Barbara and Chris Elmendorf at uh, UC Davis. They sophisticated, uh, developed a sophisticated survey instrument and, you know, really found that many people understand broad strokes, how like supply and demand and markets work in things like the car market and used cars. Housing kind of breaks people's brains. And there's this sort of folk economics that uh, takes over where instead of thinking in terms of like supply and demand, more like abstracted concepts, people are like looking for villains and they're looking for like agents that are doing things bad and like developers, right? Like developer becomes this sort of fetish word that has power unto itself. And so if a developer is going to profit, a lot of people assume, well, the world is zero sum and their profit is going to come at my expense. Now, that's not how it works, but there is a need for a larger public education, public persuasion campaign in order to you know, convince people that, hey, like your intuitions about how the car market works and if you restrict building cars, the prices will go up. That also applies to housing. <laughs> like you should extend that correct uh, intuition. Yeah, I got to think that Yimbyism probably has more populist support. It's just not as well funded. Like you said, there's misinformation about funded misinformation to convince people that, like you said, I like the car analogy. Hey, you're better off if there's not competition, which there's no way that's, that could be the case, but people are buying it. Yeah. And to be clear, there is huge, huge funded opposition in California to towards like Yimbyism in general. Some of the best funded foundations in this country spend many millions of dollars per year specifically on trying to like counter the Yimby narrative, on funding organizations to block home building, etc. There's orders of magnitude more money in the more traditional so-called equity space where you I don't really know. I mean, like, they're, it, it doesn't make sense. They basically just like focus on like rent control and 100% affordable housing with like public subsidies, but that doesn't work. So, yeah, uh, I'm being incoherent now, but there is a lot of funded <laughs> opposition, is what I'm saying. <laughs> to, yeah. No, I pick it up what you're putting down. Yeah. It sounds like a big part of this then is creating an actual sort of active, dare I say, almost sort of a punk Yimby movement <laughs> where a bunch of Yimby punks go to Yimby punk shows for pro Yimby causes and support their Yimby politicians. How do you do that? Well, that's kind of what we're doing, right? Um, so like a few things. One, that was actually like the initial idea behind SF Barf, like the proto Yimby group that Sonia started before we started Carla. You know, we think of like, oh, it's called SF Barf. No one will think we're developer shills because like we're not. Um, and Sonia and I different, but like some countercultural affinities uh, in a way like we don't look like we work for developers and we don't. Uh, yeah. unfortunately like that, that didn't work. We're still lambasted as being developer shills as taking all this money from the real estate industry and all the rest. It was never true. Now people might say that we're like shills for big tech, you know, Stripe gave us some money, like the big tech companies like Google and Apple, and they're just doing PR, like they're not actually giving money to like effective housing organizations. Yeah. Like, I think like we sort of do that in part through creating happy hours. Like I attended a happy hour in LA a few days ago that had I don't know, 75 people show up and there wasn't really even any organizing. My current research director and last research director just like tweeted it out <laughs> and then like a bunch of folks show up uh, and that was fun. So like creating that kind of like social world, I think is important. But at the end of the day, like you need infrastructure. You need an organization that knows how to build grassroots support and teams and can build them in areas where you most need to move votes that knows how to work the press and drive good media coverage and build support for your advocacy channel. Like it's the mechanics of moving policy long-term aren't all that mysterious. They're well-known. A number of organizations like do this well. Some movements have done this very well over the past, say, 50 or so years, but it does require patience and funding. Do you have any movements that you look up to as examples for how to do this? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, I would say like look up to in sort of like organizational effectiveness, yeah. not in terms of say values. 
I'm a 20th century U.S. political history PhD dropout, which was very much the right call on my part to drop out. But I studied <laughs> specifically the intellectual conservative movement, really trying to understand how it is that a number of conservative actors came together, whether they're funders, college professionals, policy wonks, et cetera, in order to really build this vast infrastructure of think tanks and comms shops and policy shops and grassroots building shops and all the rest, in order to move policy in the direction that they wanted. In some areas, most notably in the courts, the overturning of like Roe v. Wade is like the exclamation point on the sort of like the career uh, of groups like the Federalist Society uh, and others. That's really like what I'm looking for, this long-term movement building that's both movement in terms of grassroots, as well as in terms of like policy elites and journalists and people who really participate in the elite political process to move policy in your way over time. All righty, uh, let's see. We have been going for an hour, so I'm going to get to the last few things here. One of the things that I personally worry about a bit and certainly hear a lot about is the infrastructure concerns. Things like if we build out a lot, there's not going to be enough clean water. There's going to be too much traffic congestion. How do you deal with those sorts of concerns that people have? Like many urban counties use less water now than we did 30 years ago, despite the fact that we're much larger because we've gotten much more efficient there. Water, even despite this drought that we have and probably the structural drought that we have in the American West, is really not a problem in terms of people living in cities and near city areas for drinking. Now, are we going to have enough water that we can abide by the current water regime and grow lots of alfalfa in the desert indefinitely? Maybe not. But water for humans for using in urban spaces is not at all a problem in the American West. Uh, in terms of things like sewage infrastructure or whatever, hell, like many of our older cities were massively overbuilt for sewage capacity. And given the water efficiency standards that have been in place over the past like 30 years, we're just using per capita way less water per person. So there's tons of excess capacity in many places for this. But even too, right? Like, we can build more capacity. <laughs> like there's nothing to say that whatever sewage lines or water lines or utility lines that we built a hundred or hundred fifty years ago need to meet our needs until the heat death of the universe, right? Like <laughs> and use tax dollars, raise bonds, and build that infrastructure. What's more, also in in part because of the fee issue that I mentioned earlier, new development also pays not only very high fees in order to fund infrastructure development, they also are assessed at current market tax rates. And so in California with Prop 13, all of these older properties are paying a fraction of what they're worth in property taxes, which is really harming the ability to sustainably fund California. New property doesn't have that problem uh, and is a, is a massive fiscal benefit. In terms of traffic, what we need to do and what a big push of my organization does is to legalize more denser infill housing and not require parking spaces and then build out the kind of transit and micromobility infrastructure that we need to get people moving around in a carbon-free way. Do you think that's realistic? Yeah. For, uh, okay. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, if I didn't, I wouldn't be doing this. Um, it's going to be hard, but I think most things worth doing are hard. It is going to be really hard to rise to the challenges of climate change, but we have to do it. <laughs> like, the alternative is a lot worse. I know at least one friend who likes the lighter density sort of spread out feel of the suburbs mm -hmm. and kind of feels a bit resentful that because everybody wants to move to the city, that his life is going to be impacted. The area that he chose to live in specifically because it is in the law that it has to remain lighter density is going to be taken away from him. What do you say to people like that? Yeah. Well, so first of all, if your friend you know likes their single family home with their yard, then they're great. They can keep it. The Yimby black helicopters are not going to like come for him, right? And abscond him and then, you know, <laughs> stack and pack him in a skyscraper. That's just like absurd. Yeah. This is, neighbor this might so, like, the party. thing is, low density housing options are going to be available for the foreseeable future. And nothing that we're doing would change that. What we are trying to do is to change over time, missing middle density in many neighborhoods that are currently single family homes. So think like duplexes and fourplexes and maybe a three flat, et cetera, right? Like more smaller buildings, not skyscrapers um, that fit within the existing neighborhood context. But beyond that, we actually do need bigger buildings in the urban core, in our urban cities, and in like near transit in these rural commuter suburbs. And 
are there some people who currently live in low density places right in those areas that don't want their neighbors selling? Well, sure. I get that. I, I think you could say, all right, if we're going to be, you know, vulgar EA about this and start thinking about like utils or something, like, sure, maybe they're a little bit sad that six houses down, a single family home becomes a fourplex. So let's like weigh that sadness, um, all of the massive environmental and social benefits that come from legalizing more home building, right? Like massively reducing greenhouse gas emissions, massively reducing human suffering and increasing human flourishing by enabling many millions of more people to affordably live in the world's most productive economies, ending homelessness. And I started to think, like, well, okay, like this person, like I get that, that's a little bit sad, but if you're weighing the scales of what's more important, I think their feels aren't as important as all these other important social and environmental goals. Okay. The people in my community, uh, I know Stephen and me personally, are big fans of Georgism, the land value taxes. I was just going to uh, ask about this. <laughs> <laughs> we did an episode on that uh, a couple of years ago, too. How do you feel about Georgism? Do you think this is a viable solution? And how, is your organization doing anything to try to work that angle as well? So first, let me commend your enormous restraint. Uh, the fact that you're Georgist and didn't bring up Georgism for the first hour <laughs> must have been really hard for you too. Uh, so if I, uh, well done. Um, land value tax wouldn't solve everything. It really does making solving a whole bunch of problems a lot easier. So I do support a land value tax. Uh, California Yimby was on the steering committee, the executive committee, I don't know, like one of the main committees for Prop 15, the schools and communities first initiative, which would have partially rolled back Prop 13 for commercial properties. Obviously, I think Prop 13 is an abomination um, and we should properly tax the value of land. Some of the earlier Georgia's proposals of like having land value taxes as a single tax, I don't think are workable. I do think having a uh, land value tax as a significant component of the overall, especially like local and state tax regime is very important and would provide much better economic incentives for how we use land, would eliminate a lot of the deadweight losses from our current massively inefficient uh, tax system. It would also put the state on much more secure fiscal footing in that land value taxes don't vary nearly as much as, say, personal income taxes do, because California especially is highly dependent on the fortunes of a relatively tiny percentage of its population that is very high income, and their fortunes largely depend on what's going on in the stock market and you know what does the IPO market look like. I, I think it'd have positive Yimby effects too, you know? Oh, 100%. Yeah. yeah, there was a study that estimated that Prop 13 and the artificial caps it places on property taxes is responsible for about a third of our gap in housing production. Uh, yes. So it's, it's huge. Folks are always asking, wait, these crappy single story commercial strip malls where that only like 20% are like rented out, why don't those get redeveloped? And there are some places where the zoning actually is there and allows it to be redeveloped. It's like, well, that property is probably assessed at about $2 or something. The owner is paying about a nickel in property taxes a year. If they were to redevelop that, it would get reassessed at market rate. Their tax basis would massively increase. They wouldn't be pulling in any rental income for the time it was under construction. And that given all the fees and requirements of new home building, it just might not make economic sense to sell the land. If you had a land value tax, it would solve that. Is advancing that at all feasible in the political climate we have? I don't think I want to say too much about what I'm working on publicly, but I will suggest that there are alternate measures to ending things like Prop 13 other than the ballot box. If folks want to learn more, especially if they have access to money, uh, <laughs> they can uh, contact me. I am working on an effort uh, to bring that about. What's the best way to contact you? Brian at CIMB.org. Easy to remember. Cal HDF, which I guess is the new name for uh, Carla, mm -hmm. right? I actually do still work very closely with Cal HDF on a number of matters. Uh, on this particular issue, I'm not. Oh, okay. Gotcha. When I met you, it was, as I said, at this uh, meetup in San Francisco. And you mentioned at the time something that really caught my ear that basically there was a lot of alpha in just working real hard, that not a lot of people do that, and you can do so, get some huge results. Can you talk about that a little bit? What, what do you mean by that? What are people not doing that can be done just by a lot of effort? 
Well, so <laughs> there are many ways in which smart, hardworking people can really drive impact. I'm going to shout out Kevin Burke, who is a Yimby volunteer. He's a software engineer who, in his spare time, reviews housing elements and critiques them. And through filing Public Records Act requests and reviewing city documents and city emails and writing letters to the editor and op-eds, has really compelled the Department of Housing and Community Development uh, to not allow cities, especially in the East Bay of the Bay Area, to violate state housing law. There's a, another UB activist who is a neural radiologist, and in his spare time, <laughs> he does sort of like the same thing and has uh, highlighted significant malfeasance in Southern California, has likewise influenced the Department of Housing and Community Development and the Attorney General's office to take seriously what uh, some of these cities were doing against state housing law. These are two guys who they didn't spend any money doing this. They, they just spent their time and they were able to have an outsized impact. There are like any number of ways in, in which folks can like get involved. There are all sorts of ways smart, hardworking folks can help. Cool. I'm going to, in the interest of time, keep moving. My girlfriend was there with me at the event. She asked me to pass along her thanks because you gave her a lot of hope by demonstrating that change isn't impossible and government isn't this hopeless tangled mess and people actually can influence policy, which is good to know because it feels a lot of time you look at these huge forces working against you, the mass of the entire public uh, having a starkly different opinion of you and just it feels demoralizing and hopeless and like you can't do anything about it. So seeing someone go and just change things because you wanted to is very inspirational. I want to bring this around to a thing that we personally have a lot of interest in right now, which is the, the AI things that are happening mm -hmm. on the ground. A lot of people in our movement find it directly delusional to think that you can get the government to try to slow down or stop AI research at all, because you just can't work against such a mass that doesn't already have the same interests you do. Is there any hope for affecting policy on such major issues? And if so, like how? Yeah, well, I would have to think about that. So I am not, like, I think like chat GPT is cool. <laughs> like, I don't yeah. really know. I don't know much about AI, AI safety issues or potential policy responses. So I'm not the best person to ask there. I think I would first ask folks who are concerned about it, what do you want to have happen? And then start thinking, are there specific policy levers that the state government, the federal government, the FTC, whoever can pull in order to make that happen? How do I go about that? Who are my opponents going to be? How do I achieve success? Right? I mean, you probably go about thinking this sort of change the same way that I would think about change for like housing stuff. I just don't know enough about the domain specifics to really get there. One thing I did want to say real quickly, though, I think a lot of folks, especially in tech, might think, oh, like government is a morass, it's this policy, no one's the doing, et cetera. The interest groups like run everything. And I'll say that since really getting involved in state policy making, you know, starting a bit in 2016, but really in 2017, most elected officials that I meet are actually smart people who want to do the right thing and care about their constituents. Oftentimes, if you can make a good argument for why they should support a thing, and then if you can also show, and don't worry, you won't get voted out of office, other powerful constituencies aren't against me, you can often get their vote. Now, if there are powerful constituencies against you, then you got to show them that you are building a at least as powerful counterforce to deal with that. But I think that the sort of sense that like no one cares or no one is reasonable is just wrong. That's valuable to hear. And I think that you know, even the general advice of just actually plot a course for action. I we didn't really plan to talk about the AI research stuff, or at least I didn't. Ian actually, I didn't pre-discuss it. So my, my quick off-the-cuff thought there is I'm not even exactly sure what possible legislation would look like. You know, and I haven't given it a ton of thought. I know we've talked to people who have, but it's not it's not clear to me like what legislation could actually do there. But that's the first step. Figure out what your victory condition looks like and then start thinking about how do I get there? Who's gonna try and stop me? Yeah, um, I think that's all sound advice. And it, it is reassuring to hear that somebody who works with, you know, elected officials, I think it's just like, just like the internet, you know, like the, the crazy stuff gets amplified. So, you know, like the five craziest politicians, the ones that take up 90% of the TV and internet feeds, you know? Well, yeah, and like, like everyone people generalize that. 
yeah, that's actually right. And like everyone on Twitter is like looking at what the San Francisco Board of Supervisors is doing or something. It's like, well, okay, <laughs> like that is maybe hopeless. Like what you have to do there is actually just get better people elected. You need to focus on a political plan in order to elect sane supervisors that will be open to good policy. At the state level, there are plenty of folks, there are sufficient people who are open to hearing good arguments in the policy. Some stuff is just really hard because of political constraints. The federal level is different where given our terrible structure of governance, which we're probably not trying to get into, and our hyper-polarized climate and perfect partisan sorting, ideological sorting by party that we have now, you know, it's really hard to get stuff done in DC unless the leadership is engaged. There's there's less room for, say, independent like policy entrepreneurs to make impact in DC than there is at the state level. That said, it's not hopeless. You can get good stuff done. Um, like I knew folks who were really working on what came to be the Inflation Reduction Act for a while. So it was like, oh, it's hopeless. Like we can get anything done. Meanwhile, the people who are outcome oriented said, no, this is possible. It's really important. And we're going to continue working. And a lot of that work was done behind the scenes and wasn't done in public. And the end result is that we had the largest investment in clean tech that we've ever had. So even in the morass of DC, massive policy victories are possible. Hell yeah. And I find it really inspiring that like such a small organization, as long as it's driven by people who are passionate and dedicated can make a change in housing policy in California of all places. That's huge. Oh yeah, I mean, like if successful, we are going to increase state GDP by hundreds of billions of dollars a year, materially improve the lives of tens of millions of people, those who are here and those who wanna move here. The ROI for this kind of work is very high. And I would say the same is probably true with AI stuff. If maybe it's not a great percent chance, maybe it's less than 50%, but it is at least possible. And so there's hope in trying. If you don't try, then you're guaranteed to fail. <laughs> so <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Before we finish up here, is there anything I should have asked, which I didn't, which you would really like to bring up? You know, I think I figured an, an LVT question was coming and uh, he, uh, you delivered. So no, I, I think that was it. Thanks for the conversation. What else should people look at to learn more about your work, what you do? Check out our website, California Yimby. So it's C-A-Yimby.org. Um, and that's Yimby as in yes in my backyard. Uh, it's a little bit confusing because there are a lot of different Yimby groups and pro housing groups that do different things. So California Yimby is the one that I run. Check us out. Read about us. We offer a newsletter that is mostly a summary of recent housing and transportation scholarship. Um, because again, we are an evidence-based organization. And then you can also sign up for what we call like our rapid response team. If you want to call your state assembly member or state senator in support of legislation uh, or like other ways to get involved to like directly do advocacy. Um, if you have analysis or research or like mapping talents, we actually have like a research bounty program. We can actually pay you to help us assemble certain data sets or build some maps, et cetera, more on our website, under our research page. There are like lots of ways to get involved. Awesome. Nice. So that, that relates, I guess, to one quick thing. Are you associated with any like national organizations just for people oh, who aren't in California? Yeah. So I would say the Welcoming Neighbor Network. California Yimby is a member of the Welcoming Neighbor Network, which is a national organization that includes many pro housing groups all over the country. They haven't been around for all that long, but what they've accomplished uh, in a short of time is quite impressive. And I am bullish on their future. All right. Well, this was awesome. I really enjoyed the conversation. I, I mean, I thought it would be more philosophical than what you guys had hoped to achieve, but hearing all of your successes, and yeah, I guess I admit I didn't do a lot of pre-research. Uh, <laughs> I'm glad to hear you guys have been, been crushing it and a lot more on the horizon. This is awesome. Oh, thanks. And you can read more about our successes um, again on our website at caimb.org slash impact. And again, if some other time we want to talk theory, uh, more than happy to do that. But I often think it's more important to talk about outcomes and what we've accomplished. Absolutely. Thank you for joining us. All right, thank you. Awesome. Stephen, we are now going to the less wrong sequences, which this month we recorded out of order again. Yeah, I realized after last week's or last whatever, last episode, that all of my like we we're talking about is reality beautiful, etc. And I, you know, talked about levels of abstraction. That was all before we talked with John Wentworth. It felt like, oh, he was just using the same buzzword they used, you know, five times during the episode. But no, I actually used it like three days before we talked to them. So right. take that. Yeah. But before we get into the less wrong sequences, we are going to do the thing that we always do and talk about the Guild of the Rose. Uh, our friends there are 
making a big difference for rationality in the world. We are trying to help getting the word out. Hell yeah. Matt is saying that this week's monthly decision-making workshop focuses on the different common types of probability distributions and how and when to apply them. That seems like something that uh, a rationalist could use quite frequently. There's a lot of words in there that sound like rationalists speak. <laughs> well, probability distributions are definitely an important part of Bayesian reasoning. It's also an important part of this week's uh, Less Wrong posts. Absolutely they are, which we did not plan, but kind of cool that it worked out that way. I'd be curious to, I'll have to check out what that course specifically entails because different probability approaches, well, yudkowsky has got some opinions about that. Yeah. Some might, say, some might be less beautiful than others. His first post is beautiful probability. It's a bit of a, a long one, but the, the setup is kind of the whole point. So I'll try and summarize it really quick. He, it's a, a quote from um, E.T. Jane's that says two medical researchers used the same treatment independently in different hospitals. Neither would falsify data, but one decided beforehand that they would use, because of finite resources, he would stop after treating N equals 100 patients, no matter how many cures were observed. The other had staked his reputation on the efficacy of the treatment and decided he would not stop until the data had indicated a rate of cures def definitely greater than 60%, however new patients that might require. In fact, they both stop at 100 because they got 70 cures each. And the question is, should we draw different conclusions from their experiments? I actually have some opinions on that, but I want to save those opinions till the end. I guess first I would just say that what happens in this post is Eliezer speaks eloquently and at some length about how probability theory is math. And math is supposed to be neat, clean, self-consistent. It follows laws. And uh, that is how Bayesian probability is and should be. And that is right and good. And he extols its virtues in that regard. <laughs> I liked how, because the intuition there is that scientists do is scientist number two is doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. And therefore their, their results are less trustworthy. And I think that's the intuition. And he's the, the point is he's arguing against that. He's like, no, we have the exact same trial, the exact same numbers, you know, that's, it's the same data. But I liked the quote here. He says, non-Bayesian statisticians might shrug and, you know, and say, well, not all statistical tools have some, have the same strengths as weaknesses. You know, a hammer isn't like a screwdriver, yada, yada, yada. Life is messy. And then there's the Bayesian reply, excuse you? <laughs> <laughs> the, you know, because the, the, this is the common complaint of the Bayesian approach that like, oh, it's subjective. You're making up numbers, you know? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. he's like, well, you're saying that we're too subjective, but you're saying that the, uh, the evidential impact of an experimental method producing the same data depends on the researcher's private thoughts. <laughs> mm -hmm. that, that's, I think, the crux here is that I'm not saying the evidential impact of a fixed experimental method producing the same data depends on the researcher's private thoughts, but everything else about the experiment does. Yeah. And yeah. so imagine a perfect, you know, perfectly spherical vacuum uh, setup here. Like, yes, these, these results are the exact same and the evidence is equally strong. Right. But in, in real yeah. life, I'm like, I'm totally going to trust guy number one more because <laughs> That's, the scientist yeah. too is hell bent on, on forcing this conclusion. And that's, yeah. That's totally the thing I want to go into too. Yeah. I like the thing he pointed out that speaking about the perfect fears in a vacuum thing, uh, I think the quote he used is, um, he said, it is a fact that you can't use Bayesian methods on many problems because the Bayesian calculation is computationally intractable. And then he points out that the Carnot cycle is an ideal engine. I don't know if I pronounced that name right. In fact, the ideal engine, no engine powered by two heat reservoirs can be more efficient than a Carnot engine. But of course, you cannot use a Carnot engine to power a real car. A real car's engine bears the same resemblance to a Carnot engine that the car's tires bear to perfectly rolling cylinders. Clearly then, a Carnot engine is a useless tool for building a real world car. The second law of thermo thermodynamics obviously is not apl applicable here. It's too hard to make an engine that obeys it in the real world. Just ignore thermodynamics, use whatever works. <laughs> yeah, this, this, this is the same problem. When you use X approximations for probabilities, it works to the extent that it approximates the ideal Bayesian calculation and fails to the extent that it departs, similar to uh, a, Carnot, a Carnot cycle and a actual internal combustion engine. Yeah, I like that. I think he puts it succinctly. It works to the extent that it pro approximates the ideal calculation and fails to the extent that it departs. Mm -hmm. uh, that sounds like a good, you know, slogan to put on a mug. Um, yes. Yeah, I think... You know, half, half my thoughts about this are like whether or not, because the thing is, I think he's talking about specifically rationalist or rationalistic judgments, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I don't think he's saying like 
this applies to literally everything all the time and it should in your life because that's that's a that's an adjacent claim but i don't think that's what he's talking about here mm-hmm. i think he's saying if you're going to say something's reasonable then this is this is the tool yeah and the, again we talked about planes and stuff last last episode needing to calculate approximations to a law doesn't change the law planes are still atoms they aren't governed by special exceptions in nature for aerodynamic calculations the approximation exists in the map not in the territory yeah Take, it's an take awesome a drink. Point. <laughs> yeah, right. It reminds me. I just recently read about uh, how the the individual blades for jet turbines are created. the The amount of actual individual atoms matter that comes into it is kind of surprising. The way that the molten metal cools and crystallizes is extremely important to the formation of these blades, which uh, you know is getting down to atom level shit. It's probably not something you would think of when you're making a propeller for the Wright Brothers plane, but the <laughs> the more intense you get, the uh, the more the approximations aren't good anymore, and you have to go down to the base level reality. I don't know why or where that tangent came from. I'm sorry. No, I, it, I, it, my it, brain is swollen. You're you're recovering from what? You're like eight days into COVID. God, so long. I, I feel like such a weakling. I don't think that that's a fair way to feel. You know, everyone experiences it differently and yeah well i don't know would a guy who played wolverine whose name i can't remember now jesus would hugh jackman just build a flex and and push exactly, it out exactly right i don't know you know I, I guess just be grateful that you were eventually able to get your hand on, hands on some packs loaded if anyone doesn't read enosh's Substack, they should because he, expl- he outlined the adventures there but it was I'm, it was kind of a just stream of consciousness post, which I usually don't post. Slash but, rant because it was the most annoying fucking rant. thing ever. <laughs> yes, but you know I had COVID brain. I didn't have a lot of energy to make words good. No, you did a fine job. You summarized the right. annoyance. But no, I'm, I'm I'm glad that you've had the number of you know vaccines you had because this could you know could have been a lot worse. You know. Yeah. So thank you for enough. that. Well, speaking of opining on things, uh, let's talk about this actual the two researchers thing that he mentions in here because. I kind of feel like this post does not stand up very well to the test of time. Uh, in particular, I think it got hit by the replication crisis pretty damn hard. You think? I think that if we if we take the example and the very specific claim that he's making about it, mm-hmm. then I think he, it's totally fine. You know, well, again, that's... it's like assume all of this. You know, yeah. Then it's like, okay, sure, I'll assume all that for the sake of argument. And what it does is it is a good intuition pump on like, yeah, but fuck that second person's experiments. They suck. <laughs> right. um, That's the thing. I agree that like if you just assume that they neutrally took data and the second guy just said, I'm not going to stop taking data until I get to a good uh, efficacy rate. Well, then you don't actually have to worry about it because either nature will in fact, as Eliezer says in the post, will in fact support that he can reach such an efficacy rate and eventually he will find it and he'll be done, or he will never get to that efficacy rate. So he'll just be trying for the rest of his life running the study and never get to that uh, rate that he wanted to. And haha, it sucks to be him doing this test forever, uh, which which is great and all, but you know, we we have other information. We we don't just assume that's the truth because we also know how humans are and we have seen the replication crisis. And in the near future, I want to do an episode on uh, a article I read called The Failure of Peer Review that basically half the studies up there out there just have made up data, like literally made up. And if I had heard that the second guy's plan was to do that, then I wouldn't be just like, oh, yeah, he he managed to correctly report on things. And so we should take his data at face value. I'd be like, yeah, no, he probably made up that entire report and I'm going to throw the whole thing out no matter what it says. Yeah. yeah, I think, again, this is like assuming we get to pour over and verify everything, yada, yada. But I've been on a kick of binging a lot of stuff written by uh, and spoken by because he has a lot of podcasts, uh, Spencer Greenberg of the Clear Thinking mm, podcast. Yeah, good um, podcast. Yeah. And uh, he was talking about uh, importance hacking. Mm. And I'll link to this post, but because it, it's it's connected. He talks about like, you know, there's there's four different ways to get published, especially like in psychology journals, but this would work for anything. Um, mm-hmm. You know, conduct valuable research. Uh, you can commit fraud. You can mm-hmm. p-hack or you can importance hack. And that's what the, this post is called. It's basically, you know, you get a finding and you you maybe disingenuously, maybe not, like overplay how important it is so that it, you know, gets more popular. Um, 
you know, an example might be a researcher finds risk-seeking behavior in video games among some certain demographic or whatever, mm. and then publishes this demographic has increased risk-seeking behaviors. Mm. And the, the very important difference there is that they did in video games. Right. Right? Yeah. And it's, I'll risk things, especially in a, in a study of, you know, like a study game all the time, because it doesn't matter. Real life is right. so different. <laughs> you reload from check. Exactly. I, uh, I've actually got to do a bunch of boring science the last few days for uh, twin study stuff. And uh, one of them was like a little video game thing where if it was real life, I would have tried harder. I, I did what I could, but I didn't like kick myself for, you know, messing stuff up or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's just kind of funny that uh, someone might try to general, you know, this is like the whole thing of video games cause violence or whatever, right? Um, mm -hmm. But in any case, uh, I, I agree. I think scientist two is definitely a bad scientist. I didn't commit total fraud, but maybe should be thrown in scientist purgatory, if not necessarily science hell. Um, yeah. And is generally much less trustworthy. Um, it's it's in fact one of the signs of a crank that their their professional career is dedicated to trying to prove a thing. Uh, it's not it's not a uh, it? it's not it's not proof positive that they're a crank. It's just a red flag. Yeah, I suppose so. Yeah, I mean it's like. Again, it's it's one of those things where I think it's evidence of crankism. It's not uh, there's there's a skeptoid episode on this like ten years ago, and that's one of the things. I think the person he gives an example of is uh, Zimbardo, the guy of the Stanford Prison Experiment. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like his whole career is about proving that the environment makes the person. Yeah, and but I mean, there's also other scientists who spent their entire career trying to prove a thing, and then in the end, after like twenty years, they were like, "Oh nope, guess I was wrong." I I concede to the Nobel Prize winner, and I guess I'll go work on something else now. Oh, yeah. No, no. Like, like You I have said, to believe it, in your thing if you're going to spend that many years working towards it. Totally. Yeah. I think it's just like, uh, not everyone who's dedicated to proving their thing for, through their career is a crank. Everyone who is a crank is dedicated to proving their thing through their career, right? If you're, if you're pushing some snake oil, you're going you're gonna to lie about it for 50 years, you know, just to get people to keep buying it. Uh, I possibly i could also see cranks going the other way where they're like just willing to say whatever don't care one way or the other as long as it pushes product fair enough or it, gets the money I, yeah. I think i think it's a uh, modest bayesian evidence that somebody it again not even not even modest it's again a red flag um, yeah yeah I, I think i think flag. even if you did if you checked all 10 flags you might still be a legit scientist you know like hmm. you know some some wild pioneer right yeah. But the thing is, most wild pioneers are, in, you know, are going to be off the mark and wrong, um, yeah. and and like egregiously so. Many of them are probably, you know, nut jobs. I think I think your red flags comment is really like kind of on the mark here because when when I read Eliezer's thing and he says that if you do better by using some sort of approximation than by using actual Bayesian laws. It's you aren't actually doing better. It's because you have snuck in some sort of prior information uh, that was not allowed into the Bayesian update. And I mean, I guess technically, I think he's right. I think the prior information that we snuck in here was that all all data from scientist number two is suspect at the very beginning due to his stated objective of forcing this uh, this study to come out positive. But then also, obviously, you should include that in your Bayesian update, and so it doesn't. To to say that it's like sneaking it in to acknowledge that just feels wrong to me. I think that's a very valuable piece of information. And if you're ignoring it just because they had the same number of subjects and the same results, you are missing something. I agree. I think that what he's saying that we can't do is it, like if we leave out the fact that the science that the scientist is sus for our Bayesian calculus, we can't use that evidence in our non-Bayesian calculus. Uh, yes. So there we go. Yeah, we have we have to use it in both. Um, and we should have used it in the Bayesian one, I guess, is what I'm saying. I agree. I think, and, and fortunately, there is an addendum to this post. A user called Cyan directs us to chapter 37 of Mackey's Excellent Statistics book, uh, which is free online, or was whenever this comment was posted, for, more thorough, for a more thorough explanation of the opening problem. So cool. I didn't actually read that because it's a, it's a textbook online, which <laughs> sounds like a Work. Rough, yeah, work, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, but it is there, and I did, I did just click the link. You can still read it online. That's a PDF. So, um, cool. hopefully, Eliezer was not face palming too hard. The the Eliezer in our heads, hopefully, is not face palming too hard as we imagine him listening to us. No, I think I think we did fine. I hope. Well, I trust I trust we did fine, just like I trust in math. Ooh, excellent. Was what is this thing about trusting in math? 
trusting in math is the it's it's a quick one and I love it because I and I wish I could remember this. There was something if I trouble myself to like log into Facebook and search for it, I might be able to find it. I have no idea what the search like Facebook UI looks like if, or if it's searchable or whatever. Hmm. But something pretty bad ten or fifteen years ago was floating around, and it was a similar thing like this quote unquote six line classic proof in here. Um, yeah, where it's like except it was bigger numbers, and at the end it's like yeah because it all means it you know it all means shit and that people just make up math and. You know, yada yada. It's like no, I'm serious. That's the conclusion. It's like a, it's like a picture. Oh my meme. god! And, oh no! Uh, I, I'm just like, you didn't just usurp math, right? Like in your little proof here, right? Right. So, I because he, your computer still work, then so does math, right? You know that the you, we don't just get to say this, and so you could look. At, so he gives this little proof that wouldn't be fun to read or listen to, so, listen to, but. It's a quick little six line X, Y thing where it ends up that two equals one. And he says, now you could look at this and shrug and say, well, logic doesn't always work. Or if you felt that math had rightfully earned just a bit more credibility than that over the last 30,000 years, <laughs> then you might suspect that the, that the flaw lay in your use of math rather than in math itself. Exactly. The novice goes astray and says, the art failed me. The master goes astray and says, I failed my art. Is this faith <laughs> <laughs> i i love that line we're gonna have to talk about that line at the end near the end he says if you want to figure out what went wrong yourself go ahead and insert the numbers one for x and y and go through it and you will you'll see where where it goes wrong and where it goes wrong is a division by zero error in the second to last line a neat part was in the previous episode, there's a line where he says, uh, when he's talking about when things go wrong with doing math, he says, in arithmetic, the legal operation is usually division by zero. And I didn't notice this until I was rereading them for the just before we did the episode. And I was like, oh, my God, he put a spoiler in the previous post for this <laughs> post. That's amazing. He, it was uh, it's not, it's not, it's not a spoiler. It's a, it's a, a hint, hint of foreshadowing. Foreshadowing. There we go. Yeah. And that's the all one. right. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's solid. Um, but yeah, he says, uh, when, when the asked question of, is this faith? He says, well, you're not going to ignore the contrary evidence. You're going to double check it. So that is why it's not faith. And I think it's totally fair to, again, just go at it with a, with a really low prior. I, I can follow this cause it's basic algebra. Um, mm -hmm. if it was more complicated math, then I would just be like, okay, well, I see a lot of Greek on the, on the screen here. Uh, and it says at the end of that two equals one, I'm going to go ahead and just assume that they did something wrong, right? Yeah. Even if I can't double check it myself, I think that I would be justified in, in believing that. Just like if, you know. Well, let's, let's talk about that. That's, that's what I wanted to talk about here. Because he said, in the post, he says, isn't this motivated skepticism? Well, yes. And you have to decide whether you're going to take the costly actions of looking for additional evidence and doing these calculations based on the evidence you have seen so far, whether that's worth, you know, the, the cost of actions to do this. And uh, then he says, perhaps you should think to yourself, huh, if I didn't spot this flaw at first sight, then I may have accepted some flawed congruent evidence too. What other mistaken proofs do I have in my head whose absurdity is not at first apparent? Which I guess, you know, is a good thing. It introduces doubt. It makes us question our priors, what we already believe. And that is a very good thing for all humans to do. But I, I want to caveat that with maybe like for all humans to do sometimes because, uh, he goes on to say this last part here, real faith, blind faith would be if you looked at the proof and shrugged and said, seems like a valid proof to me, but I don't care. I believe in math. He says, you have a doubt. Move to resolve it. That is the purpose of a doubt. After all, if the proof does hold up, you will have to discard first order arithmetic. It's not acceptable to be walking around with your mind containing both the belief that arithmetic is consistent and what seems like a valid proof that two equals one. So I think he is correct, but also this can take like a lot of time and effort every time you see one of these things. That's what I was going to say, is if this was yeah. a more complicated problem, again, with lots of Greek, Greek symbols on the screen, mm -hmm. then I'm not, I'm not prepared to take, you know, three years worth of, of high order mathematics in order to disprove it. I'm going to just right. assume it's wrong. This problem took me maybe like a couple minutes, but that was when I was like working with an okay brain. Like I've had, I've had COVID for the past week and the amount of stupid that it makes you is 
really interesting. This is the second time in my life, at least recently, I can remember, because um, this happened after I had my surgery too, for about a month, I think. Uh, I, I just felt myself be significantly less intelligent. It was it was a strange way to live life. See, that's how I feel and, all the time. <laughs> well, I mean, that's the thing. Like in that state, and I know that a lot of people live that state. I don't know how smart I actually am, but obviously there are some people smarter than me and some people not as smart. I could not have solved various things. Maybe this I could have, but there's a lot of other things that I, I just do not have the ability to solve even now. Uh, there's a lot of simpler things that I don't have the ability to solve when I'm less functional and which a lot of pe other people don't. Like, I, I don't know how we have any choice but to just take some things on faith. Like, I've seen enough proof that this works. I saw various other ways I was able to understand it when I was smarter or when when I had someone sit down for an hour and explain it to me that when I see a similar problem, I'm just going to be like, this is probably similar to when it was explained to me. And I feel good doing that, partly because I trust the people around me far more than I would trust the priest, and partly because I see the results, and the results, you know, there ain't nobody being resurrected by Jesus, but there's plenty of people being healed of COVID. Uh, the, the results make a big difference, but like, I still feel like in the end, I'm kind of doing the faith thing, and I don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> I think you're just saving I wish time. I had infinite time and energy. That That's the thing. Like... You know, we, we talked uh, last week and I used the example of like, if Neil deGrasse Tyson tells me the universe is actually 15 billion years old, not 13.4 or whatever, yeah. like I'm going to take basically on faith that he's right. Yeah. Uh, especially if like he is, if he's not the only person saying it, if every astrophysicist has to read with him, right? Right. Like, but when the young earth creationist on the college campus screams that the universe is 10,000 years old, I don't like need to personally become a geologist, uh, uh, the kind of chemist that can carbon date stuff. Um, right. I don't need to become a, a full-fledged, you know, polymath scientist to prove him wrong. I can just think, nah, I think you're full of shit. Um, and I think it's perfectly fine to save yourself the time doing that. Again, in a universe with infinite time, sure, why not? If you have literally all the time in the universe. How are we supposed to live in a world where one of the tenets of rationality is if you have doubt, you move to resolve it. That is the purpose of doubt. And also, we don't have infinite time. We don't have infinite energy. I think that you can resolve it in different ways. Like, you know, if, if I see a convincing magic trick, I haven't seen this done in person, but Penn & Teller's bullet catch is, mm. uh, is supposed to be really good. They, they let people in the audience carve or write uh, like with a, with a Sharpie or whatever onto the bullet. And then they shoot each other with it and it lands in each other's mouths or rather they have two bullets. Right. Right. And they catch them in their teeth. Right. Right. Yeah. And so like one thing is like, Oh, I just saw them catch bullets. This is amazing. It, they, they are secretly Superman. Um, mm -hmm. Or like, I feel like I've been tricked. Like, so I don't have to, I don't have to know how they do the trick to mm -hmm. just say, I don't think they actually did that. Yeah. Right. Especially right. if it's some, you know, phony uh, magician who's going to pretend like they're doing actual, actual magic. Um, mm -hmm. you know, like, I don't have to know, uh, like Uri Geller was a famous one from the eighties. Um, uh, maybe oh, with the spoon bending. Yeah. He could bend spoons and he could turn pages, uh, right. on books and he blew on the pages. That's how he turned them. Ah, but okay. like, but if I didn't know that I could just see him do it. I'm like, I, I don't think you're actually doing that with your brain. Um, mm -hmm. and in fact, when Randy, you know, is here, let's put, let's put some flour on it and if, see if, if you, if you can turn the page without the flour moving, then, uh, then you're doing it with your mind, sure. And lo and behold, he couldn't do it. Uh, so, <laughs> like, uh, anyway, like, so I guess what I was gonna say is you, you can offload some of that work. Um, I think it is totally legit to offload it to a heuristic, like, people can't catch bullets. Um, and you can also, like, if it's stuff like this, uh, you know, again, if it's something, if someone's claiming to overthrow basic algebra or, you know, math using basic algebra, mm -hmm. I'm gonna just go ahead and not believe it because I, it, it's not blind faith. It's really, really well earned faith. Um, mm -hmm. There's that, but also if it was like higher order stuff or something that was slightly more contentious, I'd be comfortable resolving my doubt by asking another expert. You know, one I trust, one who's uh, otherwise valid uh, reasoning I can, you know, follow and endorse, uh, I, or maybe multiple I hate, experts. I hate to say this, but I'm not comfortable doing that. Like I realize I have to do that because of practical limitations, but it is a thing about reality that I hate, like that we're stuck in squishy meat suits that are decaying. 
and that I'm forced to accept rather than something that I think is okay to do. I mean, I guess it's it's not morally bad to do because you have no choice but to do it, but it's just, it feels, it leaves me feeling unhappy. I wonder, I, I, it feels like it is faith and I don't like it. I guess I feel like what you're talking about, but I don't feel like this is a good example of it. If I took my, my car to the mechanic, uh, the steering wheel was shaking when I'm on the highway or something, right? Mm -hmm. That seems like a problem. Um, mm -hmm. And there's a handful of causes that I can like vaguely articulate because I know very little. I, I know some little amount about cars. Mm -hmm. um, if I take it to the mechanic and whatever, he, he takes one look at it for three seconds and he's like, oh, it's fine. And I'm like, well, how, <laughs> how do you know? He's like, oh, I'm really good at my job. Yeah. Um, you know, just trust. And I'm like, well, can you explain it? No, just, just trust me. It would take way too long to explain it. Like that sounds like bullshit, right? It does. Um, but if I take it in and whatever, they take it all apart and they say, oh yeah, you know what it is, it's, it's not your alignment. It's not your wheels. It's, it's legit. Your steering wheel just hates being at 72 miles an hour or something. It's stupid, but here's the explanation. Like, I don't have to be a mechanic to be like, okay, that, that sounds plausible, right? Yeah. I'll take, I, I'm prepared to take your word for it. Cause I can follow most of what you're saying, but yeah. You know, I can't follow most of what like most experts say on stuff because that's why they're experts. You know, they, they've put in the 20 years that I haven't. I mean, I hear everything you're saying, but that doesn't make me like it any less. Maybe this will help. Other right. scientists are spending their careers trying to disprove each other. Mm -hmm. And so like if like I've never carbon dated something, um, but lots of scientists have. It's not just one dude. Yeah. And so if if there was a discrepancy to be found there. It would have been found. I trust the process of science to to have, you know, unearthed that rather than just have, like, you know, my belief of the first scientist who said it to me. Yeah. I mean, I've I've lost a lot of trust in the scientific establishment over the past several years. And I mean, I still have enough to trust the carbon dating because that <laughs> that seems like a non political thing that I knew you were going to say that, but it's getting there. <laughs> yeah, that scientists wouldn't be punished for, for um, going one way or the other, but... Politics has crept into enough much. science lately that sure. some, some of it might I'm, be I'm, I'm, I'm trying to pull away from the science stuff because that is like a different order of problem. I think my main problem here is that this uh, this whole someone can raise a doubt in me by showing me a proof that 2 equals 1, which looks right on the surface... And then I feel obligated to dispel that doubt. And what do I do when it's complicated enough that I can't dispel that doubt on my own and I have to trust someone else? I mean, I guess obviously I could trust in math, but the whole point of our philosophy is that doubts should be investigated. You don't ignore them. I guess when I saw that proof, I didn't feel one iota of doubt in mathematics. Like, I, so I, I think maybe that's the difference is like, I saw what looks like a funny logic puzzle that leads to a counterintuitive co a conclusion, mm -hmm. you know, just like I saw Penn and Teller shoot each other in the face. Yeah. But and I mean, I don't, I don't too? think that they actually did it. I don't think this actually did what it did. Right. Some, something, there's some, there's some logical sleight of hand here. So like, I don't actually feel any doubt needing to resolve what I feel is like a curiosity of how the puzzle works, but that's different than, yeah. than doubt in the, in with a capital D. Uh, that, that is true, but also, like, I know it does convince other people, and perhaps more importantly, I am familiar with uh, Gödel's incompleteness theorem, which says that a uh, mathematical system will always have true statements that cannot be proved. I believe that's what it says anyway, something similar to that, that it can never be completely um, internally self-consistent. Any formal slice system like that can never be completely complete. You know, that makes me wonder, oh, did they find one of the places where it breaks? Is this a problem is this why other people believe that there's secret numbers or lizard man math or something it's stuff like that that i want to resolve and and this could be a sign that something is wrong with my thinking and as eliezer says it's not acceptable to walk around believing something that is completely at odds with reality i don't know like, isn't yeah, this so... how we got people who believe in um waveform collapse how do you mean uh, rather than the many worlds interpretation, they believe in um, the, the observation collapse thing. Oh, right. The uh, where like reality is like technically actually in both states and then suddenly isn't when observed. Yes. Um, I mean, I don't know. Like, so uh, the, the thing is like Gödel's incompleteness theorems and the Copenhagen interpretation. That was it. They're perfect. See, it's, it's all these, you know, again, fancy, long, 
words. Uh, yeah. I guess what I'm saying is like, I'm not a physicist, certainly not of that level, right? Mm-hmm. I'm not a mathematician of the level of, of Godel. Like, I think, but the thing is there are, there are professional mathematicians who, you know, love and study the subject for 30, 40 years. And they're not like, oh yeah, we know it's all, you know, contradictory nonsense. We're just having fun. Like, that's not how, at least as far as I'm aware, any mathematician feels. At, at the level, certainly at the level of math that I care about, everything's consistent enough. It's not like I ever, you know, if I want five bananas and I put one, two, three, four, and five in my cart, it's not like I ever end up with another number, right? Yeah. If, if there's some esoteric situation with, again, higher order, non, non-applied non mathematics where it's like, and you can see it's different, um, then like, okay, well, that's just a, a neat thing you did. I'm still not convinced that, you know, two plus three isn't five. Yeah. But I, I feel like what you're saying. Maybe, you know, it sounds like you're the kind of person who might actually just love to love to dig into math. Maybe you want to become a mathematician. <laughs> I don't think I have the chops for it. I think at this point, I actually have a mental model of Wes in my head slapping me about saying, Eniash, okay, you have done enough self-flagellating, saying how terrible you are for not, for not investigating your doubts. Get over it already because you're being a douche and holding up the podcast. <laughs> uh Maybe I don't know if he's. I, I don't know if he'd be that harsh on you. I think this is a fun. For this is the part where we talk about fun problems. These are two short posts, and you know we want to make it last more than five minutes. Um, uh, I I'm actually fine with them being short when they need to be short. I just had a lot of thoughts about you know faith and if I'm a bad person. I don't know. I got a guilt complex or something. All right, I got a well, lot of issues, man. Just- I can convincingly, or I, I can uh, confidently say that you're not a bad person, not in any measure. Like you said, we can't we can't feel bad for failing to do the impossible. Yeah, and if you know, again, this this problem, we're capable of of finding the problem with it, uh, or this this math puzzle, right? But mm-hmm. with some crazy complicated one, it's like I can't actually prove you wrong, but I don't believe you. I think that's a completely fine retort, right? Yeah, but that's also the retort creationists have to evolutionists, right? But they're they're saying that in the face of much more compelling evidence. Like they're they're the ones trying to say, look, I've disproved math, rather than you know, I I I stand firm with math. I think math's, math's history is probably stronger than your claim that you just disproved it with six lines of algebra. I mean, that's definitely true of the six lines of algebra. Yeah, all right. We, we should move on. But I, but I hear what you're saying. Sometimes it's weird because we make some similar noises that you know people who make wrong arguments make. But I think it's just – it's important to – I guess keep that in mind. You know, If you realize like, oh, I'm making the same things that people who – whatever, say wrong things are, are making, I should probably be extra careful when I investigate these thoughts, right? Uh, mm-hmm. I think that's a good lesson to draw from it, but it doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean you're wrong. He does say like, you know, faith that the sun will rise in the east, just like it did the last hundred thousand times, is different from faith that tomorrow a green goblin will give you a big gold bag of doubloons, right? This is, this is sometimes just like a, a language problem. We have one word that encompasses like two radically different kinds of thinking. All right. So I I think that's that's where I sleep at night here is like my hmm. faith that that the basics of math are are correct as I have been taught them is not like the faith of the young earth creationist who believes that, you know, all of modern science is wrong. It's, it's just, uh, we're, we're just using the same word, but differently. All right. Well, what are we going to, what words are we going to use next episode? That's a good question. We are going to be talking about, um, where to so go. The there two it is. less wrong posts will yeah. be the alias paradox and Zut alias. Well, it's, a lot. I, I can't. It's actually A L A I S. It's not alias. It's Elias. I don't know how you'd say that. Is that not how you spell uh, alias? Alias is I A S. I oh oh. You do got well, a COVID ring. Ah, oh, you, you, you're as dyslexic as I am. Fucking butts in my face and eyes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll see y'all back here in a couple of weeks. Yes. Uh, one last thing before we go, we have to thank the patron. Goodness, how did I how did I almost forget? We're happy to give a special shout out to Arn Salberg today for your support. We really appreciate it. Arn, thank you so much. It means a lot to us. 
means extra much to me in my disabled COVID state because I don't know, I'm just, I guess, more emotional somewhat when I'm uh, all infirm and stuff. So <laughs> this is awesome. Thank you. Uh, I hope that, let's see, assuming the previous interview went well, that uh, your contribution is helping to bring the word of Yimbyism and creating more housing for everybody that needs it to everybody that listens to us and the wider world in general. That's literally what it's doing. I, you know, once in a while we have episodes that like, I think are actually really valuable for consumption. Like often it's just fun and that's totally fine for me. But sometimes I think it's like, oh, the more people to hear this message, the better. And I think this is yeah. going to be one of those examples. So uh, I hope so. Arn I helped... think our previous episode too was a really good one. Agreed. Yeah. And so Arn helped bring that to the people and I appreciate it. Um, Arn Salberg, thank you. Yeah, and I, our hero. I've been I've been DMing with some of our our patrons over the last couple of weeks, and uh, I'm aware that our patron rewards are not like our tiers aren't uh, actually they don't actually do anything, and our rewards are kind of like mostly non-existent. We do have bonus content. We try to put up more than that. We'll try to put up more than that than we historically have. But if anyone has any cool ideas, let us know, and I'm open to suggestions. Oh, don't we own an O an episode to that one guy? Probably. I think we do. We should look into that in the next, in the coming months. We shall. Okay. Anyways, thank you everybody for joining us and we'll see you all again in two weeks. Sounds good. Bye. What's his name? God, a fucking COVID brain is making me blank on Matt's name. I think that's in, it, Matt. 